I am a 29-year-old female, and my partner is a 23-year-old female. We're back in our hometown visiting family for about a week. It's a very small, isolated town in the middle of nowhere, and basically in the middle of the woods. While we were here, she wanted to meet up with an old high school friend who still lives in the area, Kyle. So we meet Kyle at the beach, and right away he's acting really weird. He was making jokes about us having a three-way. He kept on making a bunch of unwelcome, overly sexual, gross comments about us. Obviously, we're unfortunately used to this stuff to a certain extent, but coming from someone who was supposed to be her good friend, it was extra annoying. So me and my girlfriend are shooting each other panicked looks the whole time. Once he's out of earshot for a second, she says that she's sorry, that he's never been like this before. We make an excuse to leave. When he comes back, we tell him that we want to get dinner at a local bar, but he asks to join us. We felt awkward, so we end up saying yes. He says he doesn't know quite how to get there, so he follows us. We get there, order drinks and food, and then head out to the patio with the drinks. He makes a few more gross comments, but is generally being way more cool and normal than he was at the beach. We're smoking weed on the patio and chilling. The food comes quick, and we finish it quicker. Now here's where it gets really messed up. So halfway through my first drink, I'm feeling really tired, which makes sense as we have had a long day. I give my girlfriend the signals that I want to go. She makes an excuse that we need to go. He keeps trying to get us to come to his house. I've got good weeds and dabs there, and you can meet my cats, blah blah blah. He's being really pushy. We keep saying no and making excuses that we need to go check on our grandpa and stuff like that. So finally we get in the car and say goodnight. We've parked next to each other. We walk up and get into our respective cars while saying goodbye. When we get into the car, my girlfriend informs me that she wants to stay at the bar but fake it like we were leaving because she doesn't want to chill with him anymore. Understandably. So we're sitting in the car waiting for him to leave first when he signals for us to roll down the window. We do, and he says, my GPS is being funny. He asks if we can lead him to the main road. To be fair, we are in the middle of nowhere, so this didn't seem too outlandish. So obviously staying behind at the bar was out. So in the car, we're talking about how pushy he was being, and she admitted she feels weird driving right back to her grandpa's house, so we should drive into town until we lose him. He's behind us for a long time, even way after he should have gotten off on his exit. We think it's weird, but we weren't sure what to do. So finally we get on a two-lane road, and he pulls up next to us, and he's waving a phone, which is clearly my girlfriend's phone. We pull over. He gives her the phone back chats for just a few seconds, then leaves in a hurry. Here's the part that makes my skin crawl. We know she had her phone, along with my phone and her weed, a few minutes before we left the bar as we were preparing to leave. She didn't take it back out. There is no way she could have left it at the bar. More importantly, he got it in his car and left the bar at the same time as us meaning he had to have already had the phone when we were leaving. It's not like we left the bar first and he saw it left on the table or something. He literally had to have been walking to the cars with us and calmly saying goodnight, with the phone already in his possession. Now the kicker. Apparently, unbeknownst to me, my girlfriend had tasted a very weird bitter taste in her straw at the bar and was already suspicious, especially with how he'd been acting. So when he walked up to the car to return her cell phone, she very casually and deliberately flashed the knife that she kept for protection in her jacket. So that's why he left so quickly. Obviously I was annoyed with her for not telling me her suspicions sooner, but she just didn't want me to panic. I'm really shaken up. A few things are clear. Number one, he stole my girlfriend's phone. And it seems like he did so, so that we would be forced to pull over on a dark road, in the middle of nowhere. Number two, he quickly ended the conversation and left when my girlfriend flashed her knife. They've been, 
good friends for almost 10 years. If he wasn't planning on doing something malicious, I feel he would have acted confused about the knife or said something like, What the fuck? Why would you flash a knife at me? What is this? A bad movie. But instead, he just booked it, which tells me he knew exactly what she was doing, reacting to a threat and preparing to protect herself and me. And number three, he probably spiked our drinks. My girlfriend noticed a weird taste in her straw right away and chose not to finish her drink. I finished half of my drink and felt very tired. A few more things. I just don't know how he managed to nab the phone without us knowing or noticing. It doesn't really make any sense. But he did. Me and my girlfriend both remember her putting it in her fanny pack perfectly. We also have no idea how he could have spiked our drinks unless he was working with the bartender. But we were the ones that suggested that bar. I don't know exactly how he did it, but I think I know why. And for that reason, my girlfriend's now ex-friend who made creepy sexual comments probably tried to drug us. And he also stole her phone in order to get us alone on a dark road. This happened to me over 30 years ago, but I remember the feeling of fear as if it were yesterday. I was in college. I'm a female, and I'm taking a course in outdoor survival. The course ended with a three-day, three-night wilderness solo. We were allowed to take a backpack, empty canteen, sleeping bag, knife, six matches, rope, a sheet of plastic, a change of clothes, extra socks, own tablets, small cooking spot, and a spoon. We were not allowed to bring food or water since part of our training was in identifying edibles and finding a water source. Once I was dropped off, I had to hike in to find a spot to set up camp. First, I had to place a flag on a tree near my drop-off point so that I could be located three days later for pickup. I was loving life, just me and nature. I had no fears, even as night began to fall. I enjoyed the sounds of the woods all around me and didn't mind not having a tent. I built a small fire and had a great feeling of peace. I slept well that night, but woke up thirsty. My search for a water source began. Happily, I found a muddy stream, let the water settle in my pot, placed the tablets in the water, and boiled it for good measure. Yuck. What a shitty taste, but at least I was hydrated. All went well and I had a great time, until my last day. It was early afternoon on the last day, and time to break camp. I cleaned up my camp area and hiked out to my drop-off spot. As I sat, leaning against a tree, I heard the sound of a vehicle off in the distance. I figured that it had to be my pickup. As I waited, a vehicle that I'd never seen before pulled up on the dirt path in front of me. Immediately, I realized that I didn't know who the man was. He gave me an odd look. My gut told me that he was bad news. He asked what I was doing out there and if I was alone. I said that my friends were behind me, breaking camp. He gave me a knowing look, got back in his vehicle, and rode off. I was terrified. I knew that I had to hide, and fast. I ran into the woods and hid. As I ran, I heard the car come back. I stayed as quiet as I could and remained hidden. I heard him get out of the car. I could hear him calling to me and walking through the brush looking for me. I was so afraid. Eventually, he gave up and I heard the car door slam. The engine starts and the car pulled away. Going back to my drop-off point was not an option, so I began hiking through the woods, hoping I would find base camp. After walking for what felt like hours, I saw a forest ranger. I told him who I was and what had happened to me. He told me that I'd done the right thing, since a young woman had been assaulted the night before. The police and forest service had been searching the area, 
Happily, he drove me to the base camp where I learned that another girl in my class had a creepy encounter with a man the night before. She had scared him away by blowing a brass whistle until help arrived. If there's anything to be learned from this, it's being sure to always trust your gut feelings and never camp alone. Years ago, I was walking my dog with my sister at a farm right by my house. The farm owner, a nice lady who still runs it today, let the public use their farm and woods for free to walk their dogs as long as the dog stayed on their leads when by the farm animal pens and fields. The farm was quite big and if you walk further in, there's little woods at the back of it which are normally quite deserted. We always feel safe walking here though because we've both known the farm owner since we were babies and the walls surrounding the farm are massive and couldn't be easily climbed over, if that makes sense. Anyway, we go into the farm and make our way to the woods because in the woods we can let our dog off the lead. After we let him off his lead, he starts walking around. The woods go in a big circle around the farm, so we usually just do a lap of the woods before coming back into the farm and going home. We were walking along chatting and then sitting ahead of us on a fallen down tree log was a man. He was just sitting there. What I mean is he wasn't drinking coffee he had bought from the little farm shop at the farm. He didn't have a dog with him. He was just sitting on the log staring straight ahead at the trees and the woods. We carry on walking and as we come close to him he suddenly looks over at us quite quickly and says, The only way out of this place is over there in this monotone voice and points at the woods, which is a part of the woods that just leads to more woods and then to a brick wall that surrounded the farm. We just ignored him and carried on walking. We told the lady who owns the farm that there was a man in the woods and she said she hadn't seen anyone go in there before us, but asked us nevertheless what he was doing. We said he wasn't doing anything, just sitting there, but we did tell her what he said to us. She looked confused and went into the woods with us and asked us to show her where he had been, so we did. We showed her where he had pointed and she said, That leads to the wall that used to separate the farm and the railroad tracks. Apparently, years before there was a railway next to the farm that just stopped being used for whatever reason, some 30 years before. Now just sits there overgrown and desolate. Don't know what that man meant about that being the only way out of the woods, but the whole thing made me feel unnerved. We never saw him again, and neither did the farm owner. This happened in May 2007, and for reference, I'm a female. I was 20 at the time and weighed about 115 pounds so overpowering me would have been extremely easy. I live in the city in Northern Ireland, and at the time, I was best friends with my ex-boyfriend. My ex-boyfriend's cousin's band decided to play a small gig way out in the countryside, so we had to drive for about an hour or more to get to the location. We arrived, and it was literally a field amongst fields, smack back in the back ass of nowhere. Apparently, one of the members of the band knew the owner of this field, and apparently we had permission to be there. I never checked, so I don't know, but whatever. There were several cars already there when we arrived. We'd packed a car full of tents, sleeping bags, and a ton of alcohol. The plan was to watch the band, then blast some tunes, have a bit of a party, and spend the night in the field in our tents. The way the field was laid out, was kind of an L shape. All the tents were set up around the corner and the band had set up a generator across the field on the other side. Then, besides where the tents were, there was a hole in a bush to the other field. We went through here to go to the toilet so we had some privacy from everyone. There was roughly 30 to 40 people in the field and the band started playing. We started drinking and generally having a good time. Anytime I needed to pee, I went with my ex's sister or a friend as it was a good few minutes walk to the next field, 
and none of us wanted to go alone, even though we were in the middle of nowhere. I was sharing my tent with my ex for the night, and at about 3 a.m., I decided I'd had enough and wanted to go back to the tent to sleep. I told him I was going and made my journey across the field to the tents. As I got into the tent and pulled the zipper down, I felt someone tugging at it and assumed it was my ex, until I heard an unfamiliar voice say, Let me in, quite aggressively. I called out, Who are you? And he said, I know you're alone in there. You can't hold that zipper down forever. Let me in. Over the next minute or so, I was gripping on the zipper of the tent and holding both sides of the fabric together to prevent this guy from getting into my tent. A couple of times he managed to get the zipper up a bit, but I always managed to get it back down. For the life of me, I have no idea how I managed to do this. The whole time we were struggling against each other over the zipper, he kept saying things like, I'm gonna get in eventually, bitch. It's gonna be worse if you don't fucking let me in. I was absolutely petrified. Then I heard my ex-boyfriend's booming voice shout, What the fuck are you doing at that tent? Then I heard a smack and a thug, and my ex called to ask me if I was okay. My ex had saw what was happening, punched the guy and he fell. He had watched me walk to the tents and watched this guy follow behind, assuming he was going to the bathroom, but he kept watching it to make sure. When he saw him turn towards the tents, he came over to make sure I was okay. Thank God he did. Anyway, a huge fight broke out and then one of the creepy guy's friends ended up hitting him too. It turns out he was known for this kind of creepy behavior and he'd been in trouble with the law for sexually harassing women in the past. My ex's cousin had said that he was staying at her house with her brother one night, and she woke up to find him standing in her room, watching her sleep. I really don't know what his intentions were had he managed to fight his way into the tent that night. No one would have heard anything as the music was loud. But thank God my ex still cared enough about me to keep an eye on me as I made my way back to the tent that night. My ex actually bumped into the guy a few weeks later and told me that his lip was still pretty busted up and looked like he was going to have a permanent scar from the two punches. For a time, I worked at a rural hospital in Mississippi. I would often drive between my home state of Texas and Mississippi in the afternoon or evening. I've seen lots of weird and wacky things, but the creepiness of the bayou back roads is unmatched. I've had naked, or at least shirtless men in ragged old pickups, waiting on the side of the road at night, try to follow me as I passed, and other assorted, stereotypical rural fuckery but the weirdest one wasn't stereotypical at all. While I was traveling I-10 one afternoon, I noticed the Prius pacing me in my blind spot and blocking me in my lane. I have them a moment to pass, and when they didn't, I began slowing down. They matched my speed. This continues for several miles, and my go-ahead wave has been ignored, so I'm finally tired of going well under the speed limit so I slow down and then punch it, taking advantage of my better acceleration to make a path ahead of them, and I shoot off about 95 miles per hour. They're speeding up now too. They stay with inside of me for the next 25 miles or so, matching my speed from 55 behind a slow truck to almost 100. They won't pass. They won't go away. I finagle traffic such that I exit the freeway without them being able to follow. I pull off to get some gas. I do my thing and rejoin the freeway, only to pass them sitting on the shoulder a short ways up, as if they were waiting for me. Well, now I'm properly spooked, so I made sure I took note of their license plate, and I continue my journey. I didn't see them again for a few miles, but here they come again, tailgating me. 
They stay with inside of me for the next 45 minutes or so, matching my speed and lane selection. At this point, I've had enough, so I again finagle traffic and force them beside me. The middle-aged couple inside the car are staring at me with the most intense look of hatred I've ever seen. I'm not ashamed to admit that my blood ran cold when I saw the look of pure rage in their faces. I give a, what did I do, sort of shrug gesture, and the male passenger gives a sarcastic, slightly crazed looking smile, and he does a, you better think gesture at his head, followed by the universal signal for cutting a throat. The female driver is all over the road as she stares over at me, forcing me over partially onto the shoulder. Incensed and obviously nervous, I give him the finger and pin the throttle. I take off and go directly to jail speeds. I didn't stop until their car had faded into the distance, and then I took an alternate route through some more curvy country roads and made sure I disappeared. I'm reasonably certain that I didn't cut them off prior to this incident, and I didn't recognize them at all. I have no idea what their problem was with me, but I'm kind of glad I didn't give them a chance to tell me. I work at a lab at the University of South Florida late, as I like to do my work with no one else around. My partner is just a short ways off campus, about a 10 minute drive and a 40 or so minute walk, depending on what I took. While I do live in Tampa, it's far and away from the cities. There's no three story buildings in sight, a few neighborhoods, ample amounts of trees and ponds and a stone's throw from a rather sizable state park of 240 acres, which in turn is adjacent to a substantially larger wilderness area. What that means is a lot of wildlife. I regularly see deer grazing on a golf course nearby. Growing alligators roam the ponds and small lakes. Turtles about. Plenty of vultures, storks, and smaller birds. And much, much more. On my nightly walks or drives, I often heard or even seen foxes, bobcats, coyotes, or even a black bear once. So you can imagine when I found out several cats and small dogs had gone missing, I naturally thought that if a predator was responsible, it'd be one of the larger coyotes, bobcats, or maybe even a bear or gator. People, especially in gated communities, leave their pets out to roam about in the day or at night. Still, that did leave a question of how a predator could, or would, get over several fences and gates, some of which would be quite the hassle to climb, and there was no sign of being tunneled under. Why go for a pet inside a box that would be hard to get out of, when fat ducks were extremely abundant? Well, I got my answer in a way I never expected. I was driving back from the lab late, around 11pm, when I stopped as I could see an animal in the road. The figure was very tall, but also very thin, so I initially thought the pale color I saw to be from viewing a deer from behind. However, I soon noticed the animal was actually pale all over its main body and had extremely thin, dark legs. When it raised itself up somewhat, I realized I was looking at a great white heron from behind. Great white herons are a regional color morph of great blue herons, being nearly all white in coloration, including the trademark tassels coming off the brows of the birds, save for the top jaw and feet which are both dark blue or black. The white form usually only appears in very southern Florida, but occasionally one will show up further north. They also tend to be on the larger end of the species size. I make no jest when I note how big this avian was. Standing up straight, some of the bigger great herons can look a grown man in the eye behind a nearly foot-long, rapier-shaped beak. The heron was throwing its head up and down and was clearly doing something, but I couldn't be sure of what. It was standing in the road about 200 yards ahead of my car and only reacted when I got closer. It swung its head around 
and I'll never forget the sight right as I stopped ten yards away. The heron was standing still, unflinching as its eyes brightly reflected in the headlights. The white feathers across the chest and the part of the wing were stained a tarry red from coagulating blood as it had half of a cat hanging out of its mouth. Herons can gulp down surprisingly large prey, such as big fish, muskrats, bullfrogs, and even young alligators. But it's one thing to see them swallow a wild creature whole, in still frame or in pixels on a video. It's a whole different ordeal to see one doing it in the flesh, after having killed its prey by impaling them on the bait. When I compared their beak to a rapier earlier, I mean it. They can impale that thing through the armored scales of a garfish. Herons have been known to kill eagles by ramming their beaks through the latter's chest. The poor cat never stood a chance. The heron didn't at all seem phased by my arrival. Instead, it flicked the dead cat back and forth some to position it in its mouth before tilting its head up. You know that shot from Jurassic Park with the Tyrannosaurus swallowing the goat? Same sort of visual at first, only with another disgusting detail. When the heron started swallowing, its thin neck bulged outwards to accommodate the food. It kept its eyes pointed straight at me, as the big wad of slain feline slowly worked down its throat to the crop, sometimes a limb visibly impressing outwards from the stretched skin. All the while, the heron let out raspy breaths while standing still, still spattered in gore from pecking the poor cat to death. And after it finally swallows its prey, the heron paced closer and to the side of the road. It actually got next to the car at one point. It was close enough I could confirm its height to be about five feet or more, because the top of its head was level with my side mirror. It was at that point I realized I had the windows partially rolled down. I was smelling the sanguine musk of death. The damn bird was level with my window, looking right at me and leaning closer. Needless to say, that snapped me out of my stupor. I blared the horn to make it back off. On the menu or not, I didn't at all like how it was looking at me. Driving down the road and making the turn, I could still see it looking towards the car as it paced down the darkened sidewalks, like it was the most casual thing ever for a four to five foot tall predator, half covered in blood, to be there. Obviously I was in no direct danger myself, being in the car, and decidedly not on the menu, but I didn't like it all the way it looked at me. This avian predator clearly didn't at all fear people even if it seemed conscious of cars and my presence. And given this happened at a gated community, I'd never seen any mammalian predators bigger than a possum in. I think I now know what was eating the pets. We often can hear nowadays that birds are living dinosaurs, but I don't think some quite register that, as the feather heads they're familiar with are fat city pigeons or delicious fowl. I think seeing this would help get the message across, and at night, every so often, I still can hear the deep, throaty shrieks that species gives off, flying over from the forests and swamps, and in to the neighborhoods. Don't leave your pets outside. This happened almost 25 years ago, way before cell phones were a popular thing. When I was 17, my brother, 13 at the time, and I were traveling into northern British Columbia in mid-November. This is important, as the darkness at this time of the year in the mountains is absolute. We were in Pine Pass between Chetwind and Prince George, BC. Anyone who knows this area knows how desolate it is. I'm talking about hundreds of kilometers between gas stations and any kind of people or buildings. We were just about at the Powder King Ski Resort turnoff and it was getting late. We pulled into a roadside turnout around 10.30pm 
because I was super tired. My brother was already sleeping. I pull in and park near some tourist signage, lock my doors, and put my seat back to sleep. I was dead asleep when something snapped me awake. To this day, I'm not sure what it was that woke me up. I was looking around trying to figure out what was happening when all of a sudden my car was surrounded by four or five men. They started yanking at my door handles trying to get into the car. I'm not sure if they saw that I was awake or not, but I sat up and slammed the car into drive and peeled out of there. I'm not sure if I hit one of them or not, and I didn't care to check. I didn't stop again until my auntie's house in Prince George was one of the three most terrifying times in my life. So to the four or five men in Pine Pass who tried to get in the car with two kids, I hope I at least ran one of your feet over. This incident happened in 2018. My then boyfriend and I were on a road trip during the winter of 2018. We took a day to visit the Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona. For anyone who hasn't been there, you drive down a long road that winds through the landscape and exit at various stops along the way to view different points of interest. We were only at maybe our second or third stop when we encountered the creep. This particular stop has a white parking lot with a handful of large educational signs at either end and a path that leads up to a historic site and various vantage points. As we made our way up the path to the main site, a man was coming down toward the parking lot. He looked pretty much exactly like Mr. Clean, but in a red t-shirt and jeans. He was tall, upwards of six foot two. As we passed each other, he muttered something odd under his breath, though it was clearly intended to get our attention. My boyfriend turned around and asked him what he said, and the man looked at us, almost stunned, for a moment, before he seemed to decide to come up with something else to say. He pointed into the distance and asked, What's that over there? All there was over there was some kind of utility box, the road through the park, and desert. We brushed him off, said we didn't know, and turned to continue up the path, when he called out. See you later, pretty girl. There's hardly a woman alive who hasn't had something like this said to her 10,000 times before, but this felt unusually sinister, and it set my nerves on edge. We both decided to just ignore him and headed up to the rest of the site. After 15 to 20 minutes of looking around, I finally had to admit to my boyfriend that I felt like we were being watched. He nodded and said, that guy hasn't left. He's been watching us the entire time. From where we were standing up on a hill, we could see the parking lot. I noticed our creep standing near an educational sign that was off on its own at the far edge of the parking lot, but he was clearly positioned to see up the hill at us. We were both bugged by it, but we resolved to not let it ruin our time or get too bent out of shape about it. We took our time at the stop, shook off the nerves, and by the time we went back to the parking lot, he'd gone. We drove another mile or two to the next vantage point, which included a number of petroglyphs on a cliff wall that you could see using binoculars. You have to take a narrow road into the parking lot, which creates a bit of a bottleneck. As we're about to enter, a blue RAV4 pulls in front of us and blocks us from coming in. It was the same creep. After a few moments of intense eye contact, with my boyfriend, the guy slowly pulled away and let us enter the lot. He left, so we told ourselves we were overthinking it, but decided to spend a good long time where we were to let him get well ahead of us so we could stop running into each other. Our next stop, a mile loop hike, was, if I remember, about three and a half miles away. We figured we'd spent enough time at the petroglyphs that even if the guy was at our next destination, He'd either be close to being done with the hike, or leaving by now. Unfortunately, he waited for us. About two miles up the road, we spotted the blue RAV4 pulled over on the side of the road. The man was standing next to the car, sort of looking vaguely into the distance. The landscape is beautiful in the park, 
even though there was nothing especially spectacular about this spot. Maybe he was just taking it all in away from crowds. As we drove by, I looked behind us. He turned to watch us and stared at our car driving away until we rounded a corner and couldn't see him anymore. When we got to the parking lot and got out to take the hike, we were both feeling rattled. My boyfriend, who normally tolerated creepiness in others to a fault, was so shaken by the vibes this guy gave off that he actually stashed the little window-breaking hammer out of his car safety kit in his hoodie pocket, just in case we needed something for self-defense. I guess that sounds nuts now, but it's just one of those things we all do to feel a little safer when we get creeped out. The hike itself is down at the bottom of this kind of valley. You walk down the steep winding path to the bottom, where the path splits and forms a circuit around this area that includes all these cool little hillocks of painted rock dotted with petrified wood. We made it all the way down to the beginning of the loop when we noticed the guy at the top of the cliff off the parking lot looking down our way. We were about half of the way around the loop when we saw this guy at the base of the hill about to start. We were relieved because we knew we'd been out there before him this time and we felt like we could finally shake him and stop feeling weirded out. For most of the loop, you can see the whole path and the whole hill up to the parking lot, but for the middle section of the walk, you're shielded from view behind those little hillocks and different topography. When we emerged near at the end of the loop, we were still feeling good, but we did take a quick look to place our creep before heading back up. We didn't see him anywhere. Maybe he decided not to do the walk, Maybe he was behind one of those little hills. As we made our way back up the steep path, we noticed him up at the top, just waiting by the informational sign. Switch back after switch back, he stayed put, apparently intently reading the sign. The closer we got, we noticed he was now holding something. As we got to the top of the path, where we knew we'd have to pass within inches of him, we tightened up, locked arms, and prepared to march right past as quickly as we could. Even though lots of people were walking by him, coming and going, he waited for us to cross his path. It turns out that what he now had in his hands was a window washing squeegee and a spray bottle with something in it. As we tried to walk past him, he turned to us and said, Hey, can you help me? I'm running out of time. And he started to hold up the spray bottle and squeegee. My boyfriend was in no mood and said, No, leave us alone, in a pretty harsh tone, as we kept walking. The guy, smiling, replied, Well, fuck you too. Nice ass though, both of you, and started determinedly following us. He was gaining on us by the time we got to the car, and I barely made it in and locked the door before he was right next to my window staring in at me. Even though I was freaked the hell out, and my instinct was to just keep my head down, I didn't want to give him the upper hand and let him make me cower. So I looked up and stared right into his eyes. Just thinking about it makes my stomach turn. He was right up next to my window, staring in unblinking, with his hand up in a frozen wave and smiling. When I looked into his eyes, the first thought I had was that he wanted to skin me alive. It sounds completely insane to say, but I think anyone who's had an encounter with someone like this will relate. When someone means you harm, there's something that kicks in and you feel it in this deep, strange way. My boyfriend had the presence of mind to start snapping pictures of the guy, who then moved around our car to try and keep us from driving away. My boyfriend started revving the engine, trying to get him to move. It didn't work. He just kept blocking us. So we started inching the car forward. He still didn't move. We tapped him. He stumbled back a bit, but kept standing there. Then we noticed there was a family a couple of cars over, staring at us over their lunch. Then the creep noticed too, smiled that nasty smile and gave us just enough room for us to get out of the parking spot, and we sped away. As we passed the family, 
The man in the front seat gave us an encouraging nod. It was sort of like, we saw that. We're watching you. We've got your back. I immediately called the park office and told them about what was going on. They sent a ranger out to check on the guy. We headed to Winslow, Arizona, and stopped at a bar to have a drink and tried to chill out. We were so freaked out that we actually checked the car for a tracking device, which also sounds crazy, but it was one of those situations where the vibe the guy was giving off turned the emotion of the events way, way up past what seems normal. Later that night, we got a call from the ranger who told us that they ended up having to arrest the guy for disorderly conduct. They asked us to provide a statement of our experience. I tried to find out more about him, or what happened after we left, but I haven't been successful. I'm so curious if this guy sounds familiar to anyone else, especially the weird window washing ploy. We, in all our adrenaline, had all kinds of wacky theories that maybe there was poison in the bottle, or the squeegee had a knife hidden in it or something. I'm sure we were overblowing it, but I've never been able to stop feeling like we dodged a bullet with that guy. Back in December of 2020, I went to Cancun for our vacation. It was one of our dreams to visit this beautiful country and enjoy their food, their culture, and their history. There was one incident that turned out to be really scary and terrible to remember. Our first day, we decided to go visit the pyramids in Chichen Itza. We had rented a car so it would be a nice and long trip to the place, since it's pretty retired from the hotel zone. We followed Google Maps which took us through a really lonely road. It was really early in the morning so we never thought it was something weird. At the middle of the road, we were stopped by a group of federal policemen which had the Yucatan insignia on their uniforms. But going to the Chichen Itza, you have to cross to another state in Mexico. I assume this was kind of the borderline between Quintana Roo State and Chichen Itza. The first thing they said was that everyone inside the vehicle should be using a seatbelt. They said they would make us a fine, which we would have to pay. But then the conversation became really weird. They asked us where we came from. We of course said Colombia. They then took my dad out of the car and took him away from us, over to a place we couldn't see him. They told us all Colombians were rats, that they are the ones committing more crimes in Yucatan. We got really scared. At that moment, a small group of cars passed by, but they weren't stopped. I got nervous as fuck. It was in the middle of nowhere, and they were heavily armed and holding their guns. At that moment, I freaked out. After some minutes, my dad came back. Of course, they let him go after he bribed them. He then told us that they were asking who he was, what his job was, and who knew he was on a trip to Mexico. In the end, we all had the same thought in that car. Those guys could have killed us on that road, and no one would have known. We could say this was a classic police corruption case, but their attitude toward us was really suspicious. We felt threatened. It's a bitter memory from that trip, luckily. That happened the first day, but the rest of our journey throughout Mexico was beautiful. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one and are doing well. If you don't mind, hit the like button and subscribe. Drop me a comment and let me know what you thought of the stories. Oh, and don't forget to hit the bell icon to turn on notifications. If you fancy checking out the perks of my Patreon or channel memberships, or want to get involved on social media, all my links are down below. I want to give a shout out to my patrons and channel members for supporting the channel, so a huge thanks to Mr. Backwoods, Sarah C., Brenda, Sharon and Ashley, Absinthe Alice, Art and Gaming, Sarah P, Pretty Girl 215, Christy, Crafty Kel, Kay, Something Edgy, Borderline Betty, Spider's Web, 
Ooh la la Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Casey, Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, Lil Smart, Jennifer, Gabrielle, Misanthropia, Ryan, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Fire 05, Jody, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you all on the next one.